The quadricycle was Henry Ford's first attempt to build a gasoline-powered automobile. This was in 1896, the same year the hero of our story was born. We all know how the vision of Henry Ford would change the landscape of the automobile industry forever in the early 20th century. I'm going to tell you a similar story with a unique twist, and it all started with a laundry machine. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is October 11th, 1896, and we are in Grafton, West Virginia. The hero of our story is George Preston Marshall, and he was a founder and owner of what would become the Washington Redskins. Yes, that storied franchise, the Washington Redskins, over there in Washington, D.C. But before I get started, I wanted to let you know that if you research more about Marshall, you're going to find out that he was infamous for his racist viewpoints. This included the name that he gave the franchise back in 1937, the Washington Redskins. Now, I'm only going to discuss the positive contributions of founding and owning an NFL team in this episode, but I'll leave a few links in the show notes if you wanted to read more about this subject. With that being said, you can go to the show notes over at thefootballhistorydude.com. And also, I'd like to make sure you smash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice so you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes each and every week. But now we're going to go ahead and we're going to hop on that DeLorean. We're going to head over to 1932 where we're going to check and see what's going on with our owner here. Now, George Preston Marshall was operating a laundry business in 1932. At the time, he was like, hey, man, I want to do something different. So he would end up becoming part owner of the newly formed Boston Braves with three other partners. In that first year, the team would have a record of four, four, and two. But they had a $46,000 loss. Now, $46,000 is quite a bit, a chunk of money. But let's put this into perspective. You see, 1932, we are kind of getting, I guess you could say, around the height of the Great Depression. Maybe not the height. I don't know when exactly it was. But we are deep down in the Great Depression back in 1932. So that's a lot of money. I mean, this is when Franklin Roosevelt was on the campaign trail. He was promising Americans a new deal. I'm going to get you out of the Great Depression. So he had some visionary thoughts for this country, just like Marshall did for the team. So he took an opportunity when the other three partners jumped ship back when they had this $46,000 loss. He's like, man, I'm going to do this thing on my own. So he would seek control of the team. But before we discuss how he kind of revolutionized the NFL, we got to go back a little bit. Let's get into the roots of the Washington Redskins. Back to 1887. Yep, we're firing up that DeLorean, man. Throw those banana peels in there. And let's hop back to 1887, where we are in a new place. And we're looking for the Washington Redskins, but they're not called the Washington Redskins. They're playing football under a different team name. You see, 1887, there wasn't really this, you know, as much the professional league. They had these different clubs. It was called the Orange Athletic Club. And they would play that way until 1919, where they would end up officially playing professional football under the name of Orange AC Golden Tornadoes in 1919. And they would play the major teams throughout the 20s. Then in 1928, they would end up playing competitively against the New York Giants and the Yellow Jackets. And they thought that if they can play competitively against these two teams, maybe they can go into the NFL. Maybe they could put their big boy britches on and scrap with the best of them. In 1929, they got their chance. They joined the NFL under the name Orange Tornadoes. Their owner at the time in 1929 when they would join the NFL as the Orange Tornadoes was Edwin Piggy Samandi. The spot that they took over was for the Duluth Eskimos. And in their first year, they would have a record of three, five, and four. And then for some reason, because they wanted to, you know, kind of, I guess, get more prestige in the league, they would change their name to the Newark Tornadoes in 1930. But they would end up with a record of one, ten, and one, which is basically, you know, they were stone dead last in the league. So the team folded and they sold it back to the NFL. And this is where Marshall comes into the picture. Now we're back up to 1932, where Marshall, with his, you know, three partners, would take control of the team, and they would call them the Boston Braves after the Major League Baseball team that they shared a stadium with. In 1933, the team would end up moving to Fenway Park, so they changed their name to the Boston Redskins. 
which at the time, their head coach, Lone Star Deeds, was a Native American. So I'm not sure if they called it, you know, the team Redskins because of the coach or not, or I'm not really sure what the deal was there. But that would be the first time they would call the team the Redskins. And then for the 1937 season, Marshall would move the team to Washington, D.C. And then the rest would become history. So now let's get into some of Marshall's contributions to the game, which he did have contributions, you know, directly on the field and with the team itself because he would move the Washington Redskins over to Washington, D.C. But his biggest contributions really came in the administrative and advancement of the fan experience, really focusing on the fan experience because he was known to be, uh, let's say, flamboyant and kind of out there and different forward thinking type of individual as opposed to just rash him, scratch him, you know, like we said before, just take ball, run ball, run into dudes. He thought, well, we got these paying customers in the stands and, you know, they're here to give us money. So why not just give them a show? I know the game is advancing and is becoming more of a uh, popular sport, but let's just give them that added extra reason to come to the stadium as opposed to listening it to on the radio. So what he did was he would, as a copycat league always does, he would look for other leagues for ideas. And probably one of the first things he did as far as, you know, make the professional leagues different than how they were before was he looked to the college ranks where they had these different kind of, you know, halftime shows as far as the marching bands goes. He would pioneer the gala halftime shows. He would organize the first team band and he would be responsible for Hail to the Redskins, which is one of the most popular team songs in the NFL. And supposedly Marshall's wife wrote the original lyrics. Her name was Connie Griffith. But the song was first played on August 17th, 1938. And like I said, there's some pretty controversial stuff that was revolving around Marshall and the Washington Redskins, especially back in 1938. I'm going to leave a link to the song, the original lyrics. I'm not going to read them aloud. Let's just say the modern song is a little bit more appropriate than the original one was. But he said that he wanted to emulate the spectacle of the Roman gladiators. So what he did was he would commission a 110 member band and he spent $25,000 for uniforms. Like I said, this is 1938. So this isn't necessarily totally out of the water as far as the Great Depression goes. But he still spent $25,000 on uniforms for people in the band to play during the game, play at halftime, whatever it is. But it had nothing to do with on the field and how his team would perform. Although I say that it kind of did because what he did was he brought the fans to the stadium and he would create this kind of unique experience like a college football game where they would just be into the game. They would be just in between plays. You got this band going and probably fans are just all over the place, probably drinking a little beverages and stuff because, you know, the other thing that Freddie Roosevelt did was he got rid of the whole prohibition thing back in the day and he would end up creating this experience for the fans to come to the game and just enjoy the atmosphere as opposed to just listening to it on the radio. But talking about the radio, you know, Mama didn't raise no fool. He realized that not everybody could get to the game. So he created a radio network that carried games throughout the South. And he would even lead, you know, this pilgrimage of thousands of supporters to rival cities to go to the games. You know, like this, we're coming into your town and we're going to take over kind of thing. But now let's take that ball cap that he had, flip it around, because he wore a a hat that was many different types of responsibilities. He would lead the change for many playing rules, and most of them revolved around making the game more exciting for the fans. Again, he always had that eye in mind, the customer, the end user experience, which is extremely important, especially when you're trying to compete at the time with the college ranks, which were way more popular. Major League Baseball was America's sport. So I gotta say, with his vision, he had to have been One of the individuals that changed America's favorite sport from Major League Baseball to professional football, National Football League. That's what I'm talking about, baby. You know, let's just get this baseball business out of the way. Throw that bat down. Pick up yourself a little pigskin football. Just start tossing that around in the backyard. And speaking of tossing that pigskin around in the backyard, one of the most notable rule changes that he would help kind of passed through the league and just make it more prominent was he was very, very proactive in liberalizing the forward pass because he realized that just running into dudes, although it was about football and, you know, the toughness, he realized that the fans wanted to see 
kind of a little bit of a mixed bag type of plays. He didn't want just running into the line. Now, I'm not saying it was not exciting for the fans when Red Grange would slip out on the edge, turn that turbo NOS button and go all the way streaking down the sidelines for a touchdown because that was extremely exciting just as it is today. Think about Le'Veon Bell and we just, you know, he pops through, goes over there, somehow squeezes out the other side and gets to a touchdown. Extremely exciting. I mean, Elvin Kamara. But wait a second. Both of those two guys, including most of your top big dog running backs nowadays, they're very popular for catching the pass as well. I mean, fantasy football. If you look at the first round, you only have probably one guy in there that's really not, you know, known for catching passes, and that's Ezekiel Elliott. But even then, you know, Easy E got to get his catches too. You got to, you know, take that little spoon and keep feeding it into his tummy. And he's like, not just feeding touchdowns or running games, he got the passing. So I would say, yes, football is changing to a passing league, whether you like it or not. And George Marshall was at the beginning of it all. Another big contribution that he made was in 1933, he championed the decision for the NFL to split into two divisions and then to always have a playoff game to determine the title. I mean, think about it now, the Super Bowl. Everybody sits and waits till the end, that final game where it's like everything on the line. You have one play makes the big difference for the entire season. I don't care if you came in undefeated. This was kind of a unique idea at the time. And, you know, they didn't really think about two divisions. They were like, well, just, you know, everybody's in the same thing. Do your thing, win the game. And at the end of the year, you're going to be a champion. He saw an opportunity to have one moment, one game matter more than anything else. And just like the other things that he did, you know, he had all these kind of ideas. And I found a quote that came from Hulk Hogan of the WWF and now the WWE. He was in the WCW and probably the WHW, whatever it was. But Hulk Hogan is one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. And he had this quote that kind of summed up the same thing as far as football goes for George Marshall. And it went as such. You can have a wrestling idea, but you need to have these momentum shifting moves, brother. We had Hulkamania movement, then it shifted to the beer drinking Stone Cold era, man. We reinvented the business with a growing black beard and become the bad guy. What's the next level, brother? Now, of course, (laughs) that's an end quote. And I uh, threw a couple extra brothers and mans in there because that's how we really talked. But it just, think about it. it. It sounds like Marshall just kept thinking this way, always towards the next big thing, the next big idea. Everything for the fans. You know, go big or go home mentality. And speaking of going big or going home, do you have a personal favorite football story you'd like to share to be played on the podcast? If you do, head over to myfootballmoment.com for the details. But let's get back to George Preston Marshall. You see, he passed away on August 9th, 1969 at the age of 72. At his funeral, there was a quote from then NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle that summed up the master showman's unusual gift to the NFL, and it went as such. Mr. Marshall was an outspoken foe of the status quo when most were content with it. We are all beneficiaries of what his dynamic personality helped shape over more than three decades, end quote. And with this, he was inducted to the inaugural Hall of Fame class in 1963. With that being said, George Preston Marshall was one of the most influential contributors to the NFL game. From a fan viewership perspective, one could easily link the contributions he made to the game to nowadays where we have over 100 million people watching the Super Bowl every year. However, what's more impressive is that his contributions to making the game a spectacle has led to a 30 second commercial in last year's Super Bowl costing a minimum of $5 million. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about one of the most influential and controversial contributors in NFL history. Next week, we're going to cover the life and career of another founder and owner, Tim Mara. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.